Today, I'd like for us to go to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Many times when I prepare a message, the Lord gives me several points, outline, put it on the screen, and we go from it that way. But you know, this time, the Lord had a different plan and a little twist to where I just meditated on this chapter, and the Lord opened up truths that I believe will really set our hearts free on some things and get us more grounded in that we are more confidently assured that God is a God that will protect us, take care of us, and deliver us. Can somebody say amen? We're at a place right now in America, and many of us are faced with very difficult situations. There are so many people that are at the brink of losing homes, cars, jobs, different things like that. And we need to realize the Lord is our protector. Some of you, your health is at risk. The doctor's not giving you a good report. But you have to stand on what God says in his word. Now, there's certain things we need to get in our hearts and do in order to activate this health, to activate this power, to activate this type of anointing that will bring us into protection and deliverance. How many of y'all know that even though uh, uh, people are saved, not everybody has the same kind of protection? Even though we're all saved, everybody in this room does not have the same type of protection. All right, I do, do believe when you pray for people, it dispatches the angels for a more heavy coverage to cover a person. That's why it's important for parents to pray over your children. It's important that you pray over family members, pray over our church, pray over your pastors. We need a heavy coverage of protection. Why? Because the assault is great upon people. Now, I'm not going to give the devil any credit here today because, first of all, the Bible said he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He just has a roar to try to instill fear in us. And if we will listen to the roar, it will bother us. I was watching a crazy show yesterday, The Call of the Wild Man. They call him Turtle Man. How many of y'all ever seen that on TV? I mean, this guy is like crazy, crazy, man. He grabs snakes up. He goes wading through muddy ponds and looking for snapping turtles that are huge that could bite his finger off. You know, he, was, he went into a barn that was, the horses were spooked because a snake was in there. But then he found also there was a, uh, a possum way up in the loft, and he went up in the loft to pick up the possum. When he picked up the possum, he grabbed him from the back of the neck, and the possum just looked like, man, I'm going to bite your hand off. He goes, with a big, wide mouth, like an alligator mouth. You know what I mean? You could see his ugly old teeth. And he said, you know what? This is what this animal does to try to intimidate his opponent. And I thought to myself, that's exactly the way the devil looks. He just got his mouth open like a big old possum, showing his teeth. But you know what? He can't do the damage like an alligator can do or some big animals. But you still realize that you must respect it. But he's not as bad as his roar. He's not as bad as his intimidating looks. You, we, we have greater power than that. Amen? So what it says in Psalms 91, it says in verse 1, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Here's a revelation. Wherever the shadow is, the object is not far away. Some of y'all get this in just a moment. I'm going to say that again. Wherever the shadow is, the object of the shadow is not far away. So if you're under the shadow of the Almighty, that means God is close by to you. Some reason the devil's got us thinking that, you know, God's way out there somewhere, way up beyond the clouds. It's so hard to be reached. Just Reach and lift in your hands. Say, Lord, if I could just ever get a hold of you and get you way out there somehow, I know that I'll be all right. Don't ever lift your hands in hopes to get a hold of a God who's way out there. He's not way out there. If you lift your hands, do it in surrender. Do it in worship. Do it in, in an expression of your praise. But don't do it because you're trying to reach for him because he's way out there. He's not way out there. He's right inside of our hearts, the power of his Holy Spirit. The day you got born again, Jesus came into your heart in the form of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself could not come into your heart because Jesus himself is the person in bodily form expressed on the earth. He came, but he went away and he left his spirit. And so what happens is we have the spirit of Jesus Christ, not Jesus himself, which is called the comforter, right? The one who will lead us and guide us into all truth. We're talking about the spirit that would come forth in power. Jesus was with his disciples. He said, Go in and, and tarry, and I will send the, the power of the Holy Spirit to you. Isn't that something? Some of us say, well, you know what? I, I just wish I could have Jesus with me. And I mean, every one of us is probably, if you've been following the Lord very long, you probably had times in your life where you said, Lord, I just wish I could just see you face to face. I wish I could, could have been like the disciples and walk with you and talk with you. If I could just touch you myself, I know, you know, it's more reality or something, you know. 
How many of y'all ever felt that way before? Have you ever felt that way? I, I have. But I want to share with you this revelation. Jesus was with his disciples for three years, showed them the miracles. His own life was there. <clears throat> he, he, he showed them how it was done. But you know what? What Peter could not become in three years with Jesus, he became more in a day when the Holy Spirit came upon him. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. We have access to that power. And if you're born again, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. But then there's a second dose. There's another dip in the fountain called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Which I want to say without apology, that's what this church preaches. We are a Holy Ghost church. We're a Spirit-filled church. We talk about it because it's in the Bible. It's real. It's for today. Which means after you're born again, you can, you can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. It's in your Bible. It didn't pass away with the apostles. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He changes not. Why would it ever be that it would ever stop unless the Bible would say it would stop? And they said, well, the Bible says when that which is perfect has come, that which you know, uh, you know, we have, like referring to the gifts, is not going to be necessary anymore. It will all pass away. That is referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's referring to an event. Amen. So th this which is perfect has come, hasn't come yet. Hey? Eh? So that means all these things aren't going to pass away. By the way, what are the other things on the list that's going to pass away if it is? Love is one of them. Well, we know God doesn't want love to pass away. Let's don't just take things out of context. Let's see it as it is. No, it's still here. It's going to remain here. The power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation in churches, in people's lives, in, pa in people, in believers. So I want to share with you this. The Lord has made it very clear that he wants us to dwell in a secret place. And when we dwell in that secret place, whatever it is, he's promised to overshadow us. And that overshadowing is a protection, a protection. So we'll wonder, well, what is a secret place? What is it? As we read on to, the, to this chapter, it kind of better explains what that may be. Obviously, it's a spiritual place, a position that we occupy in our walk with God. So it says that we must abide in the shadow of the Almighty. We've got to abide under that shadow. It's like we run under a, a, a uh, like we're little chicks and we run under the, the wings of a, a mother hen to be protected. And there's another example of that in the scripture where it even comes out with that very example. That means we must decide to position ourselves under the wings and protection of the Almighty God. How do we do that? Obviously, it's more than coming to church on Sunday morning. Obviously, it's more than just reading the Bible every now and then. Obviously, it's more than just praying when you're in trouble. Are you listening to me? This abiding is a key word. Abiding refers to you camp out there and you stay there and you live there. This is where you live. Now, how do, what does that mean? That means we must acknowledge God in every area of our life at all times. That means we must see the hand of God on our life. That means we must remember and think about on a regular basis, consistent basis, that God's watching us and we want to pleasure him. Kind of like the, the message I preached a few weeks ago on being God aware or God awareness. We must be aware of God. I believe the more you're aware of God, the less you're going to sin. I believe the more you're aware of God, the more favor going to be on your life. How many of y'all can stand some more favor every now and then? Amen? I'm talking about the blessing of God becomes on your life when you're aware of Him. And there are certain things you can do, other things that also evoke the blessing of God. But I want, to, I want the protection of God. I want to live out my covenant years. I don't want to check out early. I don't want to have no bad disease that's going to take me out before my time. I don't want to be in some wreck somewhere or a crash to where my life is over and snuffed out. And there is no, you know, you're left without a pastor, or no, no daddy and, and papa left. You know, I'm planning on living my covenant years, but I've got to know that I have the protection of God on my life. Now, this kind of rids you of a lot of possible fears in your life because some people are afraid of their own shadow, much less looking for God's. You know what I mean? It's like so many fears some people walk in because they're not convinced of this. I believe in guardian angels. I believe some people got more than others, and I believe some people need more than others. You know what I mean? I understand that. I know. I understand. 
But you've got to understand this. When you dwell in that secret place, you've got to believe you're covered. Because along with your relationship comes your protection. I said along with your relationship comes your protection. Now it's going to be up to you to believe that because you can, look, you can't just believe what you want, it becomes real. But if you stake your belief system upon this word, then this particular principle will work for you. And that is you can afford to believe this and he will be there to protect you. And the Bible said, don't fear what man can do you, but fear what God can do to you. Because he has his final say over whether you're going to go to heaven or hell or not based upon your reverence and respect for him. You don't need to be afraid of what man's going to do for you. Don't play it stupid. Don't walk down a, a dark alley alone. You know, don't position yourself in a way that you put God to the test. But at the same time, realize that God has his hand on you and he protects you. Everybody here say, I know God's hands on me. I say, I know God's hands on me. And he will protect me. I believe many times we just got to learn what it means to be in a secret place. Some people think secret place, well, that means a prayer time, a devotional time. And some of us have coined the phrase that anytime you have a devotional life, that's a secret place, and that's part of it. But it's not all of it. It's a piece of the puzzle. It's constantly abiding in him. Have you noticed the last part of the 23rd Psalm? The all-famous scripture that we can about all quote. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Do you really think that means I'm going to dwell and live in church forever? Well, you got to go home sometime. Huh? We can't sleep here. I mean, we're not going to eat here. We're not going to live. No, what does he mean? Let's get real about this. He means he's going to hang out with God. He's going to stick with God. And his life's going to be totally entwined and involved with God, surrounded by God. The center of his life is God. And everything else got to fall as they may, but he is number one. Number, verse 2, and I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. If this is the case, and you want to increase uh, uh, being in that secret place, you're going to have to start saying. Because, you know, you can find out who's really in that position of connection with God by what they say. Amen. You can't live an undercover, secret agent, Christianity type of living and, and really expect to be protected, like this is talking about being protected. Amen. No, because eventually a fool is found out by his words, but eventually a wise person is found out by his words. Amen. You have to say, you'll eventually say. It will come out of your mouth eventually the blessing of God, the hand of God, the protection of God, the favor of God, your relationship connected with God, You'll praise the Lord. It's not going to be a cliche. It's going to be something real about it. Are you listening to me? The Lord wants us to say. Everybody say, I will say. I will say, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. In other words, you're going to need to brag on him a little bit. Say, God protects me. God is watching over my children. God is blessing our church. God has blessed us with our pastors and the people in our church. God has blessed me with my job. God has blessed me with my home. God has favored me with a vehicle that I can get around from place to place and it doesn't break down. God has blessed me with health. I will say of the Lord, he is my protection in other words. He's my blessing. He's my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. And it only works when you trust. You must trust in him or it doesn't happen. You can actually say without trusting and you won't get the extra backup in the heavenlies. You must believe. Just like you have to believe for your salvation. You got to believe for your healing. You got to believe for your protection. And some of you have worried too much about your children. You've worried too much about whether you're going to lose your job or not. Some, some people, their giving has even reflected it. Too afraid to hardly move because you see the news too much. I want to encourage you to be careful how much news you watch. Because we're not a part of this world system. I don't, I don't think we should totally have our head in the ground like an ostrich. But at the same time, you've got to limit how much you believe. Because how many of y'all have found out everything on the news is not true? 
I've never seen it to be this way, but the, my spirit is saying more and more when I see the news. They're only telling us what they want us to hear. In the United States of America, if we don't have revival in the near future, we're going to go down into a third world country rank. Because that's the kind of stuff that happens in third world countries. Where the politicians don't care about you and me anymore, but they only care about one thing. And that's their own purse. Getting elected again. And you know what? If you don't use discernment and know what's real and what's not, you're going to be meditating on what's not real. And you're going to have false things that will project unto you and implant within you a deep-rooted fear about the future. I don't know what the future holds, but I do know what it holds for me. But it's up to you to know what it holds for you. That is the hand of God's on me. He's going to protect me no matter what's going to happen, no matter what it looks like, no matter what develops, no matter what transpires. I know this much. God will take care of me. He will take care of his own. He will not take care of every church goer. He will take care of his own. Not every person who goes to church. He will take care of his own. Not every person who says they're born again. But he will take care of his own. Just like Elijah, he'll send you to a, to a brook if you have to. He'll, he'll bring in a raven to deliver you the meat. God will take care of you with the manner if he has to. He'll fill up your barrel miraculously. He'll bring you the oil and you'll never run out. God's had a way of doing it, but you've got to believe it for you. Or you'll start worrying, and you'll be tight-fisted. And you know what? You'll end up being your own worst enemy to where you, you will be uh, destroying yourself with the self-destructive uh, measures that you take that fear brings on us. I refuse fear. I refuse going down in destruction. I refuse losing. I refuse the thought of not uh, uh, accomplishing the goals that God has called us to accomplish as a church, a ministry, and over your life in Jesus' name. Okay, I don't care what it looks like out there. God will raise up people that will come and stand and be faithful and be in covenant with us and will give and we can depend on it happening every week instead of every now and then. God's going to be going to bring stability to his church and his work because stability is in his people. Amen. Amen. And the faithful ones that are stable, God will deliver. And I want to say this right now. The way it looks right now is not the way it's going to always be. For some of you, that's good news. Others of you, it might not be good news. Depending on which way you go with abiding under the shadow of the Almighty or not. I'm going to run toward God. I'm not going to back up and see how little I can get close to God just so I can barely make it to heaven. This is too big of a risk to take. It's too much at stake. Eternity is a long time. I don't want to play with fire. I heard some pastor preach on hell just recently, and I told my wife we were listening to it together. She said, you know what? Hardly nobody talks about hell no more. By the way, hell is a real place. And hell ain't the hell on earth. Hell is where your person go to when they don't want to serve God, obey God, and follow God when they leave this realm. I told my wife, I said, you know what? We ain't going to never have to go there. We're never going to have to go there because we have heard the almost too good to be true news. And that is in spite of our mess ups, the grace of God and the blood of Jesus, like we sang, covers me, washes me, cleanses me, and puts me in right standing with God because I have accepted him without reservation, and I will follow him, and I will not compromise what I know is true in this word. I'm going to live for Jesus. I made up my mind. How about you? Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise him. Surely, verse 3, he shall deliver thee from the noise and pestilence. Pestilence is poisons and things that are trying to make you sick. God said he's going to deliver you whenever you Dwell in that secret place of the Almighty, and you say of the Lord, He is my refuge and fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. He will also deliver us from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He don't want sickness to come on you, He'll deliver you from it. It might look bad and you might get a bad diagnosis, but God will turn this thing around if you stand in faith. Again, it's just a possum with his mouth open. Amen. Amen. Verse 4 He shall cover thee. With his feathers, just like a, a mother hen, right? And under his wings shall thou trust. Everybody say trust. trust. You've got to develop your trust in God. You've got to develop your trust in God. You've got to develop your trust in God. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day. One year in war, years ago, back in those days, you never know where an arrow is going to be flying in the daytime from your enemy hiding in a bush somewhere. 
but you don't have to worry about any errors that fly by day. How many of y'all know the devil likes to work overtime at night to try to mess with you and give you terror in the night? Yeah. Get you to worry about your bills. Once you get up and start going to the calculator again and see if you can come out different this time. Come on now. Amen. Worried about stuff. Bothered by stuff. Worried about what tomorrow holds. Jesus said, look, to, listen, tomorrow has enough concerns of its own. Just take one day at a time. Amen. Amen. And then verse 6 it says, Nor for the pestilence that walketh in the darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near or nigh you. A whole bunch of crazy stuff going on with other people. They might be falling to, I mean, terrible. They may be backsliding, going the wrong way, don't show up at church no more. Kids really going the wrong way. You see your own, other people's lives falling apart, losing things. You know what? You may lose a few things, but don't lose your mind. This is for somebody right here. Don't lose your mind. Get a hold of yourself. God's going to take care of you in spite of it all. And anything you ever lose or ever have lost, it's up to you to use your faith to command what the Bible says you have rights to, and that is to tell the devil he's got to cough it up seven times, everything he's taken from you. Now, you can be worried about everything you lost if you don't use your faith to believe God for that. I've lost some things, but God's paid me back many times over everything I've lost. I added up before. But you know what? It ain't finished yet. It ain't finished yet. So don't fear. Somebody say, don't fear. Somebody say, don't fear. You see, a thousand going to fall at your right side and then 10,000 on the other side. And it said, the, the trouble and all these things will not come near you. You know, I can honestly say I don't know about some people who say they're Christians, but I know God's hands on me. It's up to you to be able to say that. It's up to you to be able to say that about you. Because unless you're convinced, it won't happen. Unless you believe it, it won't happen. Just going to church ain't going to earn you no extra angel to stand by you today. But if you receive faith, and when you heard the word of God preached, and you took it as your own, then you have multiplied your protection today. You have multiplied your blessing. You have multiplied your favor. Hallelujah. Verse 8. Only thine eyes shall thou, with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. You know what the reward of the wicked is, don't you? Well, it's not a good one. It's not a good reward. Now, the Lord is going to deal with all the wicked. And I'm, I'm going to tell you this right now. We're about to enter into a season where more wickedness is going to be exposed in high places than you have ever seen in the history of this world. You are. The heads of nations have never been more wicked than they are right now. They are greedy, and they don't care about people. And you can look at places like Egypt. You can look at places like Afghanistan, Iraq, other countries, and even our own now, I'm not putting the blame on just our president, because you know what? One's about as bad as the other. I don't care what part they're part of. I can't believe you said it. I already did. Why? Because it's the truth. I've been looking at this thing and discerning, because I don't take hook, line, and sinker what they try to act to do on TV. Professional actors who don't care about the people that they're supposed to be serving. We need a Holy Ghost revival, devil chasing, heaven sent, gully washing revival in America to wash it all out and start it right. We need a republic in which it was built upon. Amen. Not moving toward oligarchy or monarchy or socialism, but God wants this nation to be free, especially Christians, and the freedom of religion is supposed to be the freedom of Christianity because that was the only religion that was established on this land. It don't mean every kind of religion. You got freedom. Amen. Come on. Amen. However, I love them too. And if they got that freedom, that's up to them. May the best man win. The one that's the most committed to their religion is going to win out in the end. And I read the back of the book, and it says we win. Amen. Amen. It says we win. We win. And anybody who gives their life to Jesus is on the winning team. Amen. We're going to see wickedness. We're going to see the reward of the wicked in our lifetime. And I'm going to say it's going to begin to happen in the month of September, October, and November to the end of this year. 
We're going to see wickedness exposed in political arenas that will actually appall you as an American. It's going to be exposed. Get ready. I'm just telling you, don't be too shocked. Because if you haven't been able to discern in the spirit what's been going on, then you don't sense the rumbling of a pregnant woman that's about to get birthed. And it is God ain't going to put up with so much more because he hears the cries of his people here in the United States of America. And God is going to bring forth his judgment, exposure, and justice on this earth. And we're going to see it before Jesus returns. Amen. Amen. It says right here, our eyes are going to see the reward of the wicked. Verse 9, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. Do you see that word habitation? That's again abiding in, hanging out with God. Stand with God, an aura of God upon you, a glory of God upon you. You might not be able to watch certain TV shows. Come on, Annie. When you've got this kind of anointing, you don't just scan the internet to see what kind of ugliness you can come up with next because you're trying to medicate some kind of emotional pain. I'm talking about God heals you of your pain, delivers you of your past. We're talking about somebody who's serious enough to where you get a hold of God to where you get free of that stuff, where you forgive people, where you don't try manipulative games on folks, that you don't try to just work things to your good at someone else's expense. I'm talking about the kind of glory that you, inha- that, that you, you inhabit the presence of the Lord. You're there dwelling with him. Now, you listen to me this morning. Verse 10 says, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Verse 11, For he shall give the, his angels charge over thee, backs up what I just said, to keep thee in thy ways. Verse 12, they shall bear thee up in thy hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. 13, thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder and the young lion, the dragon, thou shalt trample under foot or under feet. What does that mean? That means that all of these different demonic forces coming at us, this is metaphorically speaking, we would be able to withstand them and walk on top of them as if we would have the strength to walk on dangerous uh, uh, animals that would be violent or, uh, what do you say, mean, try to bite you, try to hurt you. And don't get shaken by the word dragon there. That word dragon in the Hebrew is referring to any scary creature, including snakes. Amen? Some people say, well, not every snake is going to hurt you. Well, I want to shoot them all. Amen? I want to shoot them all if they're on my property. Don't matter what they look like. Say, well, some of those snakes kill mice. Well... Let them kill mice out in the woods, but not on my property. I really, I, I'm going to shoot them too. Amen? Mice. <laughs> but you don't have to be afraid of those things. Why? Because I got the gun. <laughs> no, because we got the Lord. Amen? It's like we've got to talk about this thing in the natural as well as in the spirit. Your weaponry is that you abide with the Lord. He's your gun when it comes to spiritual things. But we get under attack and begin to fear things in our heart, our minds, our emotions. It's all a spiritual thing. Are you with me today? 14. Because he had set his love upon me. Are you listening to this part? Because he has set his love upon me. Therefore, I want you to get this right here. It's really important to God that you live out your purpose. Listen now, listen here. We all have our specific purposes. We all have our our individual purpose in which we've been created that no one else can fulfill but us. But we all have a general purpose, and that's to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to worship God. Isn't that right? God had a need. He was lonely. He wanted to be worshiped. He's not on an ego trip. He's God. He wants you to worship him. He wants you to love him. Now watch this. Because he had set his love upon me, therefore, in other words, based on what I just said, Because of this, will I deliver him, and I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. My God. Please hear this. God is looking for lovers. He's looking for lovers. He's looking for people like David, a man after God's own heart. He's looking for people who will experience him in an inhabited way, like he refers to in the first verse, dwelling there with him 
in the secret place and expressing a love for God, being tender. Everybody say tender. And he says, for those people who love on him and set their love upon him, he's going to deliver them from all types of crazy stuff that will try to happen to them. I'm here to say for those of you that have been loving on God, serving God, pleasuring God, I don't care what trouble you're faced with, God's going to deliver you. I don't care what it looks like, God's going to deliver you. Now tell me, what does it mean to set our love upon him? Obviously, this is going deeper now than just acknowledging his presence. This is going deeper than come to church Sunday morning and Wednesday night when we feel like it. Huh? This goes further than reading the Bible every now and then and praying when you're in trouble. This goes deeper than a consistent serving God in the church and being a stable person. This is referring to an expression of affection towards the Lord in a personal connective way. Which means we need to fairly on a regular basis say, I love you, Lord. I just want to tell you, I love you. For no reason other than I just want to tell you, I love you. I want to say, I love you. It's not a mystery on this. But it is a truth. Every time I tell my wife I love her, I don't feel the same way. Does it mean that I'm not telling the truth? No. It's just that I can't afford to just be led by my feelings. So sometimes I need to tell her I love her whether I feel a lot of woo on the inside or not. And some people think they can't tell God they love them unless they got this big welled up of emotion that's about to blow up. Why wait that long when you can tell him, I love you just because you want to? Sometimes when I say I love you to my wife, emotions comes later. Then I begin to feel the emotion of love. Listen, love is not just an emotion. It is a decision. You can't afford to go by your emotions when it comes to love. Because God says, if you're mine, I want you to love me. And if you set your love upon me, then I'm going to deliver you in times of trouble. You will know that when trouble comes, you have no need to worry because, hey, you have deposited love unto a God who says, I'll be faithful to do what I do. You do what you do, I'm going to do what I do. Love on me, set your love on me. Guess what? When trouble comes, you can know this. I'll be there to deliver you, says the Lord. Where is your love when it's time to worship God? Are you just singing the words on the screen? Or do you pull together a love expression? Sometimes I feel a lot. lot. Sometimes I don't feel as much. But I do want to release my love. And I think some of us are stuck in our ability to feel and sense and express love. And we need the Holy Ghost to melt us down. Some of you may have been hurt Maybe hurt by your father or your mother or somebody in the past. For some reason, you just can't seem to take the risk on loving him. And you feel like, man, I wish I could let go of everything and just let a free love go out. You need to say, Lord, heal me of my stuff. And when he shows you what those stuffs are and takes you back into a memory, you need to go to that memory and live it there, bringing Jesus into the picture and let him heal you right there. And walk out free. Many of us would rather not think about it. Rather not deal with it. Why? Because it brings up emotions that we don't like. But if you go ahead and experience it. And bring Jesus Jesus into the picture. He will heal you there. To where the next time you think about these memories. You won't have the deep hurt. Of the intensity there. You'll have a freedom there. We need to be free to love each other. And free to love God. Freely you have been given it. You need to freely receive it. Then you can freely express it. Are you with me this morning? Loving God. He said, because he has known my name. Verse 15. 
He shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him and honor him. And watch this. If you set your love upon him. 16. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Isn't that good? You mean loving on God will determine whether or not you live a long life? It's part of it. You must also honor your father and your mother. You don't mind if they're serving God. Did you right or did you wrong? The Bible said you better honor your father and your mother. Huh? But don't say, well, they've got to be saved before I honor them. No, honor your father and your mother. N -n nothing else. Get over the stuff that happened to you as a child. Let the Lord heal you. They did the best they could, hopefully. No, no parents perfect. If you got kids, you done found that out yourself. Or you really stuck on yourself, one. <laughs> You got to know this much, man. We ain't perfect. It says right here, he's going to give us long life. You got to take care of your body. I don't found this much out. The more you love God, the more you're going to seriously take care of your own body. Because you realize he gave you this temple. You got to take care of it. So guess what? Your love to God is going to cause you to respect your temple to where you don't just eat sweets and all the carbs you can choke down in one day. Except because you're feeling a little emotional today. I'm under attack. Well, that's not a good reason just to eat everything and self-destruct. Amen. There's no sense in people becoming type 2 diabetes by the time they're teens or 20s. Come on. So he's going to give you long life. He's going to satisfy you and show yourself satisfied. What do you mean I will satisfy him? That means he's going to be satisfied inside and fulfilled in the journey of living this life out. He wants you to be satisfied as you live out this journey. And he wants you to know salvation. And salvation doesn't just mean born again. It means being saved from whatever troubles you. Huh? Being saved from anything the devil would throw at you. Got one more place to read and I'm out. But I want you to take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 2. I'm going to finish up today by reading from the Message Bible. I just thought this was so powerful. In this, the Apostle John is on the Isle of Patmos where he begins to have an open vision where God visits him and reveals to him about end time events. And he refers to the seven churches and this one church is the church of Ephesus in chapter 2. Just the first few verses. It says, write this to Ephesus, to the angel of the church. <clears throat> the one with seven stars in his right fist grip, striding through the golden uh, seven lights circle speaks. And then it says in verse 2, I see what you have done. Your hard, hard work. Your refusal to quit. Did you hear that? I know you can't stomach evil. That you weed out apostolic pretenders. I know your persistence, your courage in my cause. And that you never wear out. How many of y'all know that that's a wonderful thing to have Christians who will uh, work hard for the Lord, will refuse to quit on their spiritual walk and their ministry. It's good to have Christians who are bothered by evil, who can't stomach evil, who has a very low tolerance of evil. And they also know how to discern to the point to where self-proclaimed apostles and ministry gifts would come on the scene and they would be able to identify the false and know the real, which means you can have discernment and all of that. Help a lot of people, be a blessing, never give up, have deep patience, be persistent, have great courage for God and willing to face the devil off eye to eye and be willing not to give out and you can't wear us down. I mean, I know all of that's good traits, that so we should all have that. Come on, I think some of y'all do. Are you awake still? I'm going to finish up now. Just give God a little bit more time. Now, you need this. Amen? I need this. Now, hear this. But with this church, God says, all of that's good, but I still have a problem with you. But you walked away from your first love. Why? What's going on with you anyway? Do you have any idea how far you've fallen on Lucifer fall? He's saying all of these things you're doing 
And it's great. I'm pleased with. There are things that every Christian should do. And you know, so, so many of us, it's so easy for all of us to get busy, to get distracted with life. Please hear me. This is the part that God wants you to hear. This is the part that stirred me the most. We cannot afford to be so involved in our busy lives or even active in church or even in our devotional life or ministry and be persistent and be able to have awesome discernment and, and great radar of the Spirit, but still lose our connection with the Father. This is the most important part. And the enemy has a way of getting us so involved in spiritual things, what looks good, even helping the poor, the needy, and everything. Please hear me on this, that we lose our connection with the Lord and not love on Him and set our love upon Him like we should. Many Christians have lost their protection because they have not set their love upon Him. They have not set their self to dwell in the secret place. I've heard people say, how come bad things happen to good people, even Christian people. Here is some of the answer right here. As well as, it says, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. And that word also means reverentially respect and worship him. Love on him. There's something about loving on God with a real relationship that connects you to everything that's good that brings favor on you in life. There's a real, real a sect of Christianity today in America that wants a form of religion a form of Christianity even looks good on the, on the outside. They can even impress you with a good heart that they have toward helping people, but not have a connection with God enough to where they will be protected and blessed with awesome favor and know that they're in right standing with the Lord. We cannot afford to just go through the motions of this thing. God knows our hearts. We can't afford to just do the thing that seems to be the Christian thing to do. When you know yourself that you have been disconnected from the Father. Many of us, we have spent much more time doing other things because that's where our heart's at. It's good that you're in church today. That shows something about your desire to get to know God more. And because you're here, he's delivering a word to you that will challenge you to take your walk with him deeper. Into a level you have never taken it before. And that is a refusal. No matter all of these other things... I will not back down or back up on my connection, my relationship with the Lord. I'm sorry. It's not negotiable, and I will not trade it for anything else. If I have to, I'll take my phone off the hook. If I have to, I'll turn the thing off instead of just putting it on vibrate enough just to distract me when I'm trying to pray. If I have to, then I will go ahead and make the necessary changes. But you know what? All of us need to tell the Lord we love him and really mean it. And when we do, something along the way, and I mean, sometimes you may not feel like a real overwhelming love in your emotions, but you know what? If you never do, there's a problem. I'm going to say that again. If you never do, there's a problem. I told my wife, I love you. Well, you know, maybe I'm in a bad mood today, fighting a, a bad uh, warfare, you know, trouble going on, but I want to at least tell her I love her. She might let that pass a few times, but she ain't going to let it pass forever. Why? Because she knows it's not real, that it's not sincere, that it's not heartfelt enough. God wants people to have a heartfelt relationship with Him. Not that every time you say, I love you, you'll have it, but you can't go on and on and on without ever having a heartfelt connection. Say, so, well, you know what I do every now and then? Yeah, once every six months. That's too messed up. You need to come for deliverance. You need to come for healing. You need to get emptied out. And I'm not talking about devils either. I'm talking about hurts. I'm talking about difficulties in your past. Things perceived to be traumatic as a child. Things that have kept you in your flow of love stopped up to the place to where you don't have a free flow. And it feels good to have a free flow. It feels good to be emptied out. It feels good to say, Lord, I love you. And it feels good to do it. This church right here, the Lord says, hey, you walked away from me. You walked away from the first love. What you going to need to do about it? Verse 5, repent. That's not a bad word. That's a good word. Repent's a good word. What it really means is this. Turn around. Let's make a change here. 
God saying to us today, let's make a change here. Recover your dear early love. Hey, like that. No time to waste, for I am well on my way to remove your light from the golden circle. Man, what does that mean? <clears throat> the Lord says, he's already on the way to remove the glory that he has already bestowed upon you. Because if you're not pressing toward God, you're backing down. If you're not growing from glory to glory, you're going into a backslidden condition. Are you hearing me? And it says here, you do not, I'm sorry, you, you do have this to your credit. You hate the, the, the Nicol, Nicolaitans business. I hate it too. I was stumped on that word, so I looked it up. The word Nicolaitan is a group of, of evil influence, people that had evil influence during the time of the church of Ephesus. It's thought that they ate things sacrificed to idols and committed fornication and thought it was uh, lawful and permissible and normal. Boy, it sure does go with our society today. You can even say, I hate the sin of homosexuality with a passion, all the sexual perversions that we see that's uh, now available at our access on all the media. I hate it with a passion. You can hate all of that and be free of all of that, but still got away from setting your love upon him. He says, I hate it too. But connect with me and don't ever lose it. He says, are your ears awake? And he also says in the King James that he that has ear to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. He says, listen. Listen to the wind words or the Spirit blowing through the churches. I'm about to call each conqueror to dinner. I'm about to call each conqueror to dinner. I'm spreading a banquet of tree of life fruit, a supper plucked from God's orchard in paradise. What the Lord is saying here is he's calling people to be conquerors. Conquerors? Conquerors of what? Conquerors of sin. But specifically, to conquer the old, humdrum, lifeless Christianity that does all the good but does not connect in love of relationship with the Father. I believe there's probably some devils set on assignment specifically for the purpose of keeping people from having an expression of love, connection with God. People will connect with him for, for salvation. They'll connect with him for healing. They'll connect for him for give me some money, my stuff, get me out of trouble. But what about just to love on him because he is your friend we sang about in church today. And he calls you friend. 